Kevin kept saying, we have to have it be as authentic a look. We said from the beginning, you know what? To do this right, we're gonna have to just about make everything. We have to build it all. Well, Jeffrey Beecroft can do that in spades. I mean, he goes back and if he doesn't know it, he studies like few I've ever known. I immediately go to research. I immediately start grabbing all the images I can so that when I meet with the director, I have something to show him and say, do you think, does this work? We had a person called the Dead Animal Wrangler, and I needed a bunch of dead animals for the forts and things like that, and so the, the lovely state of South Dakota would give us roadkill, um, deer and antelope, and uh, we would have those soft-mounted and uh, with sawdust and use those in the set. This was not the best job to go pick up these animals. When we had to do the Civil War, I felt the film should be in the fall. And Jim t came to me because, Jeff, we can't go back east to shoot. We can't do it. We were going to do it. We can't do it now. So I built this set in the middle of a parched earth, and we irrigated it, grew all the grass, grew all the corn, everything. And then I decided that I was going to paint all the trees to fall. And so we painted probably 1,000 trees, all to have fall-colored leaves. Everybody thought it was nuts, but we got giant orchard sprayers and sprayed it all and painted every single leaf. I had to make it look like you're in Tennessee, and I think it worked. And it also is everybody's, I think, favorite set to come out to, because we've been out in, the, in Fort Sedgwick in the dust and the dirt for a long time. And it, you finally got a breath of fresh air when you got to the Civil War scene. All of the film feels so real, partly because you're putting him in these costumes that we didn't just go to your typical house and rent these pieces. It was painstaking to go through and to figure out what each costume would be. But I think when you put one of these on, I know you do, every time they were transformed. I was the costume designer on Dances with Wolves, but the Sioux are really the ones that designed the costumes in essence because all the elements came from, from history and from them. I just put different elements together to create a character. I like the whole idea that when an actor puts on the costume that they feel the part and become the part and are the part. That is actually my biggest challenge. When they feel that, then I feel that I've been successful. I helped my granny tan hides when I was a kid, and uh, that's something that was definitely a part of my reality. It helped connect to who I was as that person. Once I got the dress on, I was kind of, I remember the first day thinking, there's no way. It was like flying in over the prairies, like, oh my gosh, three months of this thing, come on, you've got to be kidding me. But it goes away. I, after a few days, I don't think I ever thought about it. It's like putting on a uniform. It was just what you wore. It's tiny in here. Everything was new when you make it, and uh, we had to really age everything down tremendously so it looked like it, was, it had been worn for many years. And don't forget, when Native Americans make these kind of co uh, costumes with the quill work and what have you, the women sit there and they take months and sometimes years in creating these costumes, whereas well, we had to do it in a very short amount of time. These costumes were all hand-designed, all done with natural tanned leather stuff like that, natural tanned buffalo hide, and uh, the smell of the natural tanned stuff, it's, it's intoxicating, it's wonderful. I think Elsa just did a superb job. I think she really got it, and she worked with absolutely nothing. She had, like, no money, and we all had no money. But we didn't really know that then. <laughs> and now we know that we had no money. It's very important for me to, to work to, very close with the production designer because it's, it's a very close marriage together. We worked out the color palette together so that we would be in harmony with that. Because uh, ultimately, I mean, he being the production designer, you're really responsible for the whole look of everything. But he trusted me explicitly once I started going and he felt comfortable. As usual, they, they just leave the costume designer alone. The most defining moment for me was after the hard work of getting the costumes together and made and completely finished. I think when we did the camera test, literally brought tears to my eyes because it was like delivering a baby. To me, on Dances with Wolves, it was a huge, it was a huge moment when it all really came together, and it's when we did the makeup and wardrobe and hair tests, which are generally fairly technical tests. You put the actors 
in a little stage somewhere. And in this case, it happened to be a deserted concrete store in Pier in South Dakota. And we put a camera down, I put a track down, and I had a wind machine, a little fan to blow the hair. And I lit fairly dramatically in there just to get a good look at Kevin in all of his different hair pieces and wardrobes and moustache and with the Native Americans with their traditional looks, which I could only imagine as a kid from Australia, I could only imagine the Native Americans some with feathers. And, but it was pretty straightforward camera wardrobe test. We screened it a couple of days later in Pier in the uh, projection room we had set up at the hotel. Looking at these people and looking at the wind blowing their hair and the camera would move on in their face and their... Set. Action. <laughs> well before I even arrived in South Dakota, I received this tape, my language tape, that Doris Leader Charge sent me. And Doris, who passed away last year, was the shining eye of that whole experience. She's just this sparkly, amazing woman. And she became our coach. <laughs> as soon as I heard Lakota spoken very slowly, I knew that I would probably be okay. I kind of understood the sounds. I kind of understood enough of where it was placed. And then when we arrived in South Dakota and we started doing language class, I felt more confident because I assumed naively that I would be the only one struggling with the language because I was the only white girl, you know? But um, my fellow Native Americans speak in different tongues than Lakota. Not everyone was Lakota. So we were all learning some new sounds and I didn't feel quite as um, lost as I'd had anticipated I would be. The sounds in, in Lakota are, to my experience, they're a mixture of Cree sounds and, and the Dene sounds. My grandmother spoke both Cree and, and um, Dene. So it was kind of fun to, to be able to do that. I remember one morning after about a month of uh, learning the language, that I got up went right through the entire script without looking at it. Then the next day, I couldn't remember a damn thing. <laughs> it was frightening, I'm telling you. Uh, she didn't let her language die, and her spirit lives on, it, both in this film and in the people that she's touched. She ensured for her people that her language would live on and live on in this movie, and she ensured for herself that her presence will never die. It's kind of hard to talk about Doris because I miss her. There was an energy that Doris carried into everything that she did and her commitment to the language and her commitment to educating Native Americans. She's a very serious warrior, Doris Leader Charge. But she had the biggest heart I've ever met. And she had more fun than anyone I know seeing Doris on the stage in her Native American dress and having her speak Lakota to me made every single moment of it have more meaning. Well, a large part of making this film, what makes it work, is that whole emotional side, which we said from the beginning, it's kind of got to be a family affair because we knew we were out there a long time. Kevin had his three children. You know, I had my daughter, my wife. A lot of people kind of made the trek out there. Um, and we invited that. We said, let's do it. The morale really wasn't the problem. We thought it might be when you're that far away from home. But every week there were great stories to tell and, and people were pooped anyway by the weekend. They better be. There's no question from day one that we knew the look of the film was coming through, that what we had hoped for with the landscapes that went on forever and the beautiful color and the end of the day and the morning light was all there. When you have a star who's also directing a picture, um, Kevin can only spend so much time composing and looking through the lens, and so you had to lean on Dean a bit. Dean was a veteran, a great Australian who brought some of his crew with him. Yeah, I would say uh, you know a good deal of the look of the film is Dean. I think the look of the film just sort of evolved, really. I know Kevin had very strong images, very strong images of the way he wanted to shoot it, and certain images in the film. He had really, really 
strong pictures in his mind. Um, but I think you put together the following, uh, South Dakota, the prairies in summer, the Black Hills in the fall, and then the Black Hills in the winter. I mean, it's not a bad start. Now put Geoffrey Beecroft's, like his great design, his great villages, his great buildings. Fort Sedgwick, as tiny as it was, was really a magnificent set and very workable. Put together on top of that the Native Americans with the superb wardrobe that had been designed. And then give it some like late afternoon light and the autumn leaves and boy, you know, you've got a lot to start with there. So the look sort of became what it was and what Kevin had wanted, I think. I always felt armed with the script and everything I saw in the camera, if it didn't tell me the story of the script, then I wasn't interested. And Dean really respected that. I loved the idea of doing a Western, another Western, something with that scope, something of that proportion. I just wanted to do the picture. It was one of those that you read and there's no question. You want to be part of it. Good. You're out, good. Good. Exactly, that's the ticket. Dean made the working relationship great. I had never worked with a cameraman, so I wasn't exactly sure how to do it. You know, I mean, I didn't know what the etiquette was, and I had an idea how I wanted it to look in terms of pretty straight ahead. You know, I don't try to get too fancy. And Dean just absorbed that and then brought his skill to my approach to it. In this shot, I'll start to make... I'm sure there's probably things... I mean, I even look at things now, I think, oh, I'd do it just a little bit differently. And I'm sure Dean maybe was thinking the same thing, really, even on the spot. But very gracious man and, and let me have my head with the way I wanted to tell the story dramatically. And he just lit it beautifully and really just gave us images that we'll never, ever forget. It really is warm, it's romantic, it looks like a painter lit it. You can have great sets, but if you don't have great light, you can't see them. You can't see the sets, you can't see it. And, and Dean always brought that with him. He would somehow find a way, no matter what time of day we were shooting, no matter what was going on, he found the magic of that particular light. I mean, he just knew what to do. And so everything that had this potential magic in it started coming on the screen, scene by scene by scene. I was absolutely blown away. Oh, I could go on about him forever, <laughs> actually. I think most people have a misconception when they, when at least the people that I talk to about what an editor does, they think that an editor is like a censor, the person who cuts out all the dirty words and the bad parts, the picture. Actually, the editor is probably just the opposite. The editor is the person who puts the film together. The look of the picture editorially is something that evolved as we went along. Kevin had a definite point of view as far as how he wanted the film to look, but that was mainly expressed through, uh, through Dean and through the way it was photographed. The thing that is easy about editing is when the director takes on the uh, authority of deciding what the, the structure of the scene. I mean, the scene, a very structured scene is easy to edit. Yeah. Because, because you know by the very way that the director puts the film together, by the way he films the film, how he wants it cut. Neil uh, cut No Way Out, and I think the very best cut of No Way Out was his cut. And it wasn't a rough cut, it was, I looked at that cut, and the movie didn't end up that way. The movie was successful, but I never thought the movie was as good as what Neil had done. The one nice thing about being an editor, although I feel it's a semi-creative job, there's nothing that an editor does that cannot be changed. Uh, once the uh, once Kevin gets finished filming the picture and I get the film all together, he'll come in here and tell me whether he likes what I've done or not, and he'll change it. He can change anything he wants. He'll change it a number of times uh, till we get it to suit him. And then that's called the director's cut. Because this is Kevin's first film. He didn't somehow speak the language that I'm used to in, in the editing room. I mean, he wouldn't say, like, I want to more in the shot or I want a over the shoulder or two shot, he would say things to me like, I want the shot to be more beefy. And I, for a while, didn't know what he meant. 
for a while it felt like he was trying to motivate me like he would motivate another actor or something instead of just telling me what he liked and what he didn't like. But we developed the language, and as a matter of fact, I would go to Jim every now and then and ask him to help me translate Costner, because Jim spoke Costner very well. I, I took a little while longer for me to catch on. The pace of the film is a glorious opportunity to take some time, to let things happen, like Kevin's dance around the fire where he becomes an Indian right before our eyes. That's something that could have been over with quick or thrown out of the movie, but he allowed things to take the time they took. For a director, I'm sure it's very difficult to take a scene which he's expended hundreds of thousands of dollars on and a lot of sweat and energy and days standing in the freezing cold to film and then just say, let's chuck it, let's throw it yeah. out. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> just, I mean, it'd be like throwing part of your body away. And those, those, tins, those kinds of decisions, when we get down to that, tend to create tension. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be, we'll, they'll be tense. It'll be tense moments, and it's difficult, to, it's difficult to avoid. The original edict from Orion was that they wanted to have the picture two hours and 20 minutes long. I remember that because that became sort of a sign that we hung in the cutting room, sort of like two hours and 20 minutes. We've got to get it down to two hours and 20 minutes. And there came a time when it would just be like amputating arms and legs to get it down to 220. We en ended up getting it down to three hours, and that was not without some struggle. An editor is most successful if his work is invisible. If you can go to a movie and you can look at a film and you can uh, not know what an editor does, not know that any of those cuts existed. As it progressed and as it got more and more along, uh, I found myself really pleased to have the opportunity to work on it. And I could find very little to find wrong with it. It is breathtaking, and it is probably more so than I could have envisioned. has a good fortune of looking at all these elements that have come into the pie and and then seeing them and having being able to put the right emphasis on these elements as they actually are Kevin and I talked about great composers of the day and we always said this is really seems like John Barry material let's give it a flyer so we sent John the script and John responded right off the bat. He said it would be an honor. It was a total different experience for me. And wonderful being an Englishman to be able to sit down and write this 100% all-American story. It was obviously going to be, or needed to be, a very melodic score, I thought. I love working with melody. I think if you can capture the essence of something in the simplest possible way, which is what melody is, then you're halfway there. When we choose where the music's going to go, for the most part, I would say 90% of the time, those choices are really very, very clear. And both the director and yourself are in sync. Can we see this again, please? There are areas, however, where I'll say, there's something here I'd like to do. And the director may have said, well, I never ever thought of music in there. I don't see that at all. And I'll say, well, look, let me do it, you know. And they say, okay, you want to do that, fine. And they usually get a little, you know, huffy about it, but for the most part, they say, right, go ahead and do it. And he brought his tape, and he played us the eight or nine cues. And 
five of the cues, I just loved them. I just loved them. And the other three cues, I didn't like them as much. And I kind of said so. Well, I didn't realize that John doesn't like to rewrite himself. I mean, he's a tr true artist. He's a true artist in every sense. But I think I just came at him so naively. But if I had looked at him probably in retrospect, smoke must have been coming out of his ears. The collaboration with Kevin was fine. Kevin, this was his first directorial job, and he asked a lot of questions, and I explained why I was doing this and why I was doing that. And I think for the most part, it was very easy going. I basically told John that I wanted a one-man parade. Okay, so we needed more snare drum in a very staccato, legato, viola bass. <laughs> Legato? Legato or regato? You know what legato means, Kev? Uh, soca. It means the cat. Soca. Legato. Legato. The cat. Yeah, well, that's. Uh, he understands exactly what I mean. <laughs> We're not, we're, we're not exactly sharing the same vocabulary, but there's this street thing between John and I. It's one of the most wondrous times in the picture for me because it's like near the end of the project, all of the real creative input has been done early on. And you end up getting to the point where